And of course, a lot of this you'll be familiar with because um, the, uh, the Cynics Aria um, make it a point to connect with the Holy Scriptures and especially with the, the events of the life of uh, the uh, apostles and the prophets and, and others. We'll begin with uh, the Holy Apostle Peter. The Holy Apostle Peter, first called Simon, was born in the town of Bethsaida on the north shore of the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee. He was the son of Jonah, the tribe of Nephtali. He was married and lived in Capernaum, following the, mod the modest profession of fishermen with his brother Andrew, who was a disciple of St. John the Baptist. At the beginning of our Lord's public ministry, the Holy Forerunner indicated to Andrew and John, the son of Zebedee, him whom he called the Lamb of God. Andrew went back to his brother and said to him, We have found the Messiah. The next day he took him to Jesus, who looking at him said, Simon, son of Jonah, you will be called Cephas, which means Peter or Rock. This change of name signified for him the transformation of his life. And from that time on, while not completely abandoning his fishing, he followed Jesus as he moved around Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing all manner of diseases. When Jesus had taught in the Capernaum synagogue, which by the way, we'll see the, the, the ruins of that when we go to the Holy Land, God willing, Peter invited him to his house where his mother-in-law was in bed suffering from a high fever. Jesus healed her, and immediately she got up and served him. One day, the Savior got into Simon's boat to preach to the crowd that was pressing too closely about him. When he had finished speaking, he told Simon to launch out into the deep and let down his nets. The disciple and his companions obeyed, although they had toiled all the previous night without success, and they took so many fish that their nets broke. Now, remember, this was the first time that happened. There was another time that happened as well, right? Remember when that happened? After the resurrection. Same kind of event, but the second time the nets were not broke. And that's very significant. Amazed at this sign of Jesus' power, Peter fell at his feet and exclaimed, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. But Peter lifted him, but Jesus lifted him up and said, Fear not, from henceforth you will catch men. Peter left his boat, his nets, and his family to follow Jesus. His love was so ardent that he became the head of the choir of the twelve apostles called by the Lord, not as a head possessing coercive authority. How would, how would that be possible when the Lord had forbidden them to have hegemonic aspirations among themselves, but more as the mouthpiece of the apostles and the master's privileged companion. It was also because of his zeal and ardent love that he chose him, along with James and John, to be the witness of the most magnificent manifestations of his divine nature. At the raising of the daughter of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, and especially at his transfiguration on Mount Tabor, which we'll also see, by the way, their character as privileged disciples made them recognized by the other apostles as pillars of the church. After the Lord had multiplied the loaves to feed more than 5,000 men, he commanded his disciples to get into a ship and push off from the land while he sent the crowd away. Night having fallen and the ship being buffeted by the waves with a contrary wind, Jesus came to them walking on the water. The terrified disciples thought they were seeing a ghost but Peter, carried away by his faith, got out of the boat at Jesus' command and went to meet him on the water. We know that story. It's a, it's a very common one in the Gospels. We hear from it all the time. Suddenly seized, though, by human weakness, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus stretched out his hand and took a hold of him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? As soon as he got into the boat, the wind died. Such a man was Peter until the Holy Spirit had sealed his faith with the perfection of deifying grace, an ardent and impulsive man, with an unreserved love for the Messiah, which made him surpass the limits of nature, though clothed in weakness and imperfection. When, a little later, Jesus revealed that he was himself the bread of life, which had come down from heaven, 
and that only those who ate the flesh of the Son of Man and drank his blood would have eternal life. That's John chapter 6. Many of his disciples left him, finding his words too hard. Jesus turned to the twelve and asked them if they should also leave. Peter replied at once, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. On another occasion, arriving at the region of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus, after having questioned his disciples on opinions, men who had about who the Son of Man was, asked them, but you, who do you say that I am? In front of the others, Peter exclaimed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Lord praised Peter for his confession of faith and his divinity, saying that it had been revealed to him by the Father, and he added, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Immediately after this incident that had shown that Peter's love for the Lord had brought him to the knowledge of the truth, Jesus began to speak of his passion and resurrection. And Peter, falling yet again into human weakness, rebuked him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. Jesus turned from him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. In the same way, at the Last Supper, as the Lord was washing the disciples' feet, Peter refused vehemently. Jesus replied gently, If I wash thee not, thou shalt have no part with me. The meal being ended, the Lord told them more clearly than before that he must be given over to death and rise again, and he predicted that his disciples would forsake him. Peter, once more carried away by his zeal, cried out presumptuously, raising himself above his companions, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Jesus replied calmly and sadly, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me three times. Peter followed Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane with James and John, and those who were counted worthy of the light of his glory on Tabor were witnesses of his agony of the extreme manifestation of his human nature, but still succumbing to their weakness, they fell asleep while the master was weeping tears of blood in his prayer. However, when the servants of the high priest arrived and raised their hands against Jesus, Peter seized his sword and cut off Malchus's right ear. Jesus rebuked Peter and told him to sheathe his sword, reminding him that it was necessary that he be arrested, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. This outburst being checked, Peter abandoned the Lord with all the other disciples and followed the procession from afar to the palace of the high priest. Having succeeded in getting into the courtyard, he was recognized by a woman servant who said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. Seized upon with fear by the woman's words, he who had sworn that he would go willingly to death for the Lord denied him. Questioned for the third time, he swore with strong imprecations, saying, I know not the man. Immediately a cock crowed, and Peter, remembering the Lord's words, went out and wept bitterly over his denial. The morning of the third day after the Passion, Mary Magdalene and the other holy women, who had seen the empty tomb and the resplendent angel who proclaimed to them the resurrection, went to tell Peter and John. The two disciples ran to the tomb, and the beloved disciple, arriving first, left Peter to go into the sepulcher before him. There they saw the grave clothes lying in a corner. That same day, it seems, the Lord appeared to Peter alone. That's mentioned in Luke chapter 24, verse 34, and also 1 Corinthians 15, 5. Sometime later, the disciples having been returned to their occupations on the, on the lake of Tiberias, they had been working in vain through the night when someone called to them from the shore and told them to cast their nets once more. While they were struggling to drag on board the 153 great fish that they had caught, John said to Peter, It is the Lord. Immediately leaving the net, Peter threw his cloak around him and jumped into the water to swim as quickly as possible to shore and throw himself at Jesus' feet. After having eaten with them to show them that he was indeed alive in flesh and blood, Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? 
And Peter, offsetting his triple denial with a triple confession of his love, was restored to his place as leader of the apostolic choir by the divine power of repentance and was confided by the Lord with the pastoral responsibility for his church. After having been present at our Lord's ascension, Peter became the head of the community of about 100 people that met together in the upper room, continuing in prayer while awaiting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He proposed that they draw lots for a replacement for Judas the traitor, and Matthias was elected to be, the, be of the number of the apostles. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, came to the full knowledge of the great mystery of salvation and were from then on able to bear witness of the Lord before all people, telling abroad the wonders of God in various languages. Peter, always first in zeal, spoke, proclaiming to the many Jews who were present that Jesus, this man whom they had put to death, was truly and indeed risen, and then sitting at the right hand of God as Christ and Lord had sent down upon them the Holy Spirit. More than 3,000 people seized with compunction repented and were baptized that day. The community grew rapidly, but the apostles still went regularly to the temple for the Jewish prayers. One day when Peter and John were going there to pray, a man crippled from birth asked alms of them. Peter looked at him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. A very great crowd having gathered, Peter told them, more clearly this time, that the miracle had only been worked by the power of Jesus the Messiah, whom the prophets proclaimed, and that it was for their salvation, the Jews in the first place, that he had risen from the dead. Many of his listeners embraced the faith, and the number of the faithful rose to about 5,000. But the temple guards came and arrested the apostles and put them in prison. They appeared the next day before the high priest and the Sanhedrin, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, declared that they had acted in the name of Jesus, whom they had crucified, but who had risen, and that there is none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. Being convinced of their assurance, the judges set them free, forbidding them to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter replied, We cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. And he continued to proclaim the good news with boldness, taking thought for the faithful and watching over the good organization of the community. A certain Ananias and his wife Sapphira, having lied about the price of the field in which they had placed the sum at the feet of the apostles, were severely reprimanded by Peter. Ananias fell down dead, and his wife followed shortly after. That's Acts 5, verses 1 to 10. As the apostles continued to preach in the temple, showing many signs and wonders, they were imprisoned again, but an angel went by night and freed them. The guards found them in the temple and took them before the high priest. When he reminded them of his ban, Peter replied, We ought to obey God rather than men. And he declared that they were witnesses that Jesus Christ had risen to give repentance and the remission of sins. Released after having been flogged, the apostles did not abate their daily preaching. They were making themselves quite a nuisance, weren't they, in those early days? <laughs> Glory to God that they were. <laughs> For our salvation. Peter, having gone to Samaria to confirm the newly baptized there, Simon the magician offered him money to be able himself to obtain the power of the Holy Spirit. But the apostle replied forcibly, Your money perish with you, because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. That's Acts 8.20. He then went to Lydda, where he healed a paralytic called Aeneas, raised Tabitha from the dead in Joppa. And while he was stopping for some days in this town, staying in the house of Simon the Tanner, three times he had a vision calling him to eat without making any distinction between clean animals and the unclean ones forbidden by the law. Shortly afterwards, messengers arrived from Caesarea saying that the Roman centurion Cornelius having been informed by an angel, had sent them to find him. Arriving in Caesarea, Peter began to speak about Jesus in Cornelius' house, and the Holy Spirit descended on his pagan hearers, <laughs> as on the day of Pentecost. 
Despite the amazement of the Jewish believers, he ordered that they be baptized, saying, Can any man forbid water that these men should not be baptized who had received the Holy Spirit as well as we? On his return to Jerusalem, he was taken aside by the Jews and had to tell them of his vision to convince them that pagans must also be admitted to the church. When King Herod Agrippa had killed James, the brother of John, in AD 41 or so, he also arrested Peter. The night before the day on which he was due to appear for judgment, while he slept chained in the prison, an angel of the Lord appeared, filling the cell with light. As soon as he touched Peter, the chains fell from his hands at the angel's orders. He dressed, passed through the doors that opened of themselves, and went to the house of Mark's mother, where a group of the faithful was at prayer. He then went down to Caesarea and thence continued his preaching in Judea and more distant lands. In his first epistle, St. Peter addresses himself to the Christians of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which presupposes that he had visited there in these regions in order to evangelize them. Other traditions mention that from Caesarea, he visited Sidon, Doritus, and the rest of Phoenicia. Then, after a stay on the island of Antarodos, he evangelized several towns going as far as Laodicea. This is all up into Turkey, modern-day Turkey, by the way. Okay. In Syrian Antioch, he confronted Simon the magician, who was tricking many people with his satanic subterfuges, and ordained St. Marcion and St. Pancratius to go and evangelize Sicily. He then went to Tiana in Cappadocia, then Ansira in Galatia, where he raised a dead man. Continuing his travels to Pontus, in Pontus, I should say, he found his brother Andrew in Sinope, then evangelized Amasia, Gangra in Paphlagonia, Claudiopolis in the province of Honorius, and arriving in Bithynia, stayed in Nicaea and Nicomedia, where he sowed the word of the truth. Again, these are all areas in eastern and western and eastern Turkey, modern day Turkey. You know, the beautiful thing about this, as I'm reading, you know, we, we, we've heard of all these stories, right? I mean, now we're starting to hear about after the book of Acts. But everything we heard up to this point from the Gospels and the book of Acts, the Synaxarian puts in chronological order, which is really cool. That's, that's what helps, I think, at least me, to get the big picture of, of, of Peter's energy <laughs> and the power of the Holy Spirit in his life and what he did, you know? And we're going to see the same with St. Paul as well. It is said that it was from Nicomedia that he set out for Jerusalem, finding, where Paul, finding there Paul and Barnabas, who had arrived to report on their missions to the pagans. When some of the faithful of the Pharisees' party declared that the pagans who had turned to Christ must be circumcised, a long discussion ensued. Peter spoke, emphasizing that it was useless to impose the burden of the law on these believers, because all men, whether Jews or, gen or pagans, are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Finally, after James, who, had, who was presiding at the meeting, had spoken, they decided not to bother the converted pagans with the, obs with the obsolete demands of the Old Testament and asked them only to abstain from meat offered to idols, illegitimate marriages, and the blood of animals that had been strangled. St. Peter then went to Antioch, mingling there freely with believers of pagan origin, but when some of the brethren arrived from Jerusalem, he refrained from associated with, associating with Christians of Gentile birth. Paul took this up in public and exhorted him to live in conformity with the teaching of the gospel and the decisions taken at the Council of Jerusalem. That's Galatians chapter 2. That's, that incident is mentioned. That's one of the reasons why we in the Patriarchate of Antioch hold as our two patrons Peter and Paul. As we'll find out in a little bit that St. Paul's home church was Antioch, the Church of Antioch. And Peter, of course, we hear, was also there. Resuming his apostolic travels, Peter then consecrated Evodus, the Bishop of Antioch, then Prochorus for, for Nicomedia, and Cornelius the Centurion for Heliopolis. There, it seems, he had a vision of the Lord who ordered him to push on toward the west. Passing through Tarsus, he ordained Orcanus. In Ephesus, he placed 
Frigilis, who later left the church to follow Simon the magician. In Smyrna, he ordained Apollos, the brother of St. Polycarp. Olympus at Philippi in Macedonia. Jason in Thessalonica. Silas in Corinth. And Herodian in Patras. These were also, uh, beloved, these were also apostles of the 70. Okay? You'll, you'll find some familiarity with these names. Landing in Sicily, Peter was received with great honor by his disciple, St. Pancratius, and finally arrived in Rome, where he taught the people daily about the true faith and the Holy Trinity. Jealous of the apostles' increasing fame, Simon the magician, who, had been, who having been taken to Rome to be executed, had succeeded in influencing Emperor Claudius by his marvels, brought a great crowd together and pretended to raise a dead man by one of his artifices. He also took various forms, calling forth the admiring amazement of his spectators. This Simon the magician was demon-possessed. I mean, the man was, was totally, totally possessed by the devil. When he was carried in the air by two demons... Peter prayed, and the, and the magus, or, or the magician, fell to the ground and perished miserably. The people uttered cries of admiration at the power given by God to his apostles and listened to Peter's teaching with fervor. After having consecrated Linus as bishop of Rome, he moved on to Terracine, ordained Eponetus in Spain, Crescens in Carthage, and arriving in Egypt, instituted Rufus as bishop of the Thebaid and Mark in Alexandria. Where did we hear the name Rufus before? Remember? <laughs> the donkey, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Rufus the donkey. But Rufus was the father of Simon of Cyrene. And who was Simon of Cyrene? Anyone remember? The one who carried the cross of Christ. So all of, all of these connections are coming together in the early church. All of these people went after Pentecost... Uh, these people were all there and they'd received the Holy Spirit. Well, they went out into their own you know, areas, right? Rufus went back to North Africa, which is where Simon of Cyrene was, which is where the, his family was, Rufus's family was. And so Peter later made the rounds to all of these different places, you see, and ordained and consecrated all of these men as bishops in, the, in these Christian communities. Peter was in Jerusalem to be present at the Dormition of the Mother of God, then returned to Rome to confirm the faithful there, and, it is said, finished his apostolic journeys in Milan, even going as far as Great Britain. Having received a revelation from an angel that he would find death in Rome, St. Peter obeyed the designs of Providence and returned to the capital, where he ordained Clement to succeed Linus. We've heard of Clement of Rome. Claim it's mentioned also in the book of Romans, by the way. Uh, to succeed Linus, who had just died. It is said that he was arrested on the orders of the emperor Nero, whose two wives he had converted. And that his two disciples having been freed, he was crucified head downwards at his request. For he said, the Savior having been crucified the right way up to look toward the earth and the damned that he was to deliver it was fitting that he, a disciple, should look toward heaven whither he was going. Holy, glorious, and all audible Apostle Peter, please pray for us. What can be said of St. Paul? The first after the one, quote, when, when that master of eloquence, St. John Chrysostom, was seized with a sort of inebriation as soon as he pronounced his name, interrupting his discourses to sing his praises. He who saw himself as the least of the apostles, unworthy even to be called an apostle, became a chosen vessel of grace like none other, both in the abundance of revelations and spiritual gifts, and above all, in the labors and tribulations endured for the name of Christ, so that he could truly be called the apostle par excellence. A Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, he was born in Tarsus in Cilicia around A.D. 10. 
in one of the Jewish communities of the dispersion that remained fanatically faithful to the traditions of their fathers. He had received the name Saul and enjoyed, through his father, the privileged status of a Roman citizen. He grew up in that cosmopolitan town in contact with Greek civilization, but his zeal for the law decided his parents to send him to Jerusalem, where joining the sect of the Pharisees, he followed the teaching of the famous Rabbi Gamaliel the Elder. He shared his father's hatred for the Christians, whom he saw as dangerous transgressors of the law, and was present with approval at the stoning of St. Stephen. Animated by a furious eagerness and breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he went into the houses, seizing men and women and throwing them into prison. Having received letters of recommendation from the high priest, he left for the synagogue in Damascus to take the followers of Christ whom he, whom he found there to Jerusalem in chains. As he was nearing Damascus, we know the story, a light from heaven suddenly enveloped him in its radiance. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, he asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the voice replied, and told him to go into the town. Saul got to his feet, but could see nothing and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by his companions. He remained there three days, eating and drinking nothing, until the moment that the disciple called Ananias, having been warned by an angel, went and laid his hands on him in the name of Jesus to restore his sight and baptized him. Immediately, becoming a new man filled with the Holy Spirit, St. Paul began to proclaim Jesus, the Son of God, in the synagogues to the great stupefaction of the Jews <laughs> who had heard of him as a relentless enemy of the Christians. They finished by coming together to kill him, but warned in time, Paul was able to escape, being let down a wall in a basket. He then went to Arabia, to the east of the Jordan, where he spent two years preparing for his mission in solitude, fasting, and prayer. From that time, his, his whole life being entirely consecrated to the Lord's service, who had seized hold of him, he pressed on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, reserved for all his servants. He could boast that he was dead to the law, that he might live in Christ, proclaiming aloud, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You notice all these scriptures that are being quoted here. Those of us who know the Bible, that's the, these are you know, particular you know, verses being quoted here. The Lord revealed himself to him in many visions and revelations, and one day he was caught up even to the third heaven and there heard unspeakable words that no man before him had heard. That's in 2 Corinthians 12. Far, however, from becoming arrogant through the excellence of these revelations, he devoted himself all the more to the ministry of the gospel with an ardor that scorned all risks. He was imprisoned seven times, flogged five times by the Jews, stoned once, shipwrecked three times, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the brethren, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, and in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides these things that are without, the care of all the churches. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He gloried, however, in all these weaknesses and took delight in the outrages and persecutions endured for Christ. For well, the Lord had himself declared to him in a vision, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's 2 Corinthians 12. Fulfilling the ministry of preaching by signs, marvels, and the power of the Spirit from Jerusalem to Illyria, which is, is modern-day Albania, by the way. Illyria is modern-day Albania. And to the furthest west, the, the apostle presented himself as weak and, and, and all a tremble, his discourse having nothing of the wisdom of the world and wishing to proclaim nothing other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. He made himself all things to all men that he might at least save some of at any price, engendering the disciples in Christ for whom he never ceased to suffer voluntarily 
until Christ was fully formed in them by the grace of the Spirit of Sonship. That's Galatians 4. Having stopped briefly in Damascus after his time of solitude in Arabia, Paul had to flee again, and he went to Jerusalem. As the faithful were afraid of him and could not believe that he had indeed become a disciple, Barnabas introduced him to the apostles Peter and James and stood guarantor for the authenticity of his visions. From that time onwards, Paul came and went with them, preaching in the name of Christ with assurance. But after only two weeks, the Hellenistic Jews, having resolved to kill him, he was taken by the disciples to Caesarea, where he set sail for Tarsus, his homeland. Shortly afterwards, the news having reached Jerusalem that some pagans had embraced the faith in Antioch, they departed, or they, they, they deputized, they, they deputed Barnabas to go there. He became convinced of the grace given by God and went to seek out Paul in Tarsus, and they lived for a year in Antioch, teaching a large crowd in the town. It was there that the disciples were first given the name Christians. A prophet having declared that a great famine would afflict the empire officially, especially Palestine, excuse me, the faithful of Antioch made a collection and charged Paul and Barnabas with taking this assistance to the brethren in Jerusalem. After their return to Antioch, one day when the community was at prayer, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me for, for me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. That's Acts 13. When they had fasted and prayed, the brethren laid their hands on them and sent them on their mission. They set sail at Seleucia for Cyprus. At Salamis, they immediately began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues and crossed the island to Paphos, where the Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulus, embraced the faith in spite of opposition from the magician Elimas, whom Paul struck with blindness. <laughs> it's amazing how the apostles... They, they ran into these magicians in their, in their, in their ministry, right? And, and, of course, those were definite conflicts with the kingdom of darkness, you know? It was Simon the magician with Peter and this, this Elimas uh, with, uh, with Paul. From Paphos, they reached Perga in Pamphylia and went thence to Pisidian Antioch, where Paul converted a number of Jews and proselytes after having preached repentance in the synagogue. The following Sabbath... Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. And when the Jews opposed the apostle, interrupting him with blasphemies, he retorted, Seeing you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. That's Acts 13. With great joy, the pagans who were present welcomed his preaching and embraced the faith. But the Jews, having gained the support of the eminent men, had Paul and Barnabas driven out of the city and the two apostles went to Iconium. They also began their preaching there in the synagogue, and a great crowd of Jews and pagans adhered to the faith. The apostles extended their stay, the Lord bearing witness to their teaching with signs and wonders. Their success, however, provoked even greater opposition from the Jews, who remained incredulous, and they had to take refuge in Ly Lycaonia. At Lystra, Paul healed a man crippled from birth, and the crowd, taking the two apostles for gods, wanted to offer them sacrifice. The Jews, however, arrived from Antioch and Iconium and succeeded in turning the enthusiasm of the people at, at Lystra to hatred. Paul was stoned, then dragged outside the city as dead. As soon as he recovered, he left for Derbe, where he made many disciples, and then returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch to strengthen the hearts of the believers, saying to them, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. In each church that he founded, the apostle appointed elders to govern the community, settle disputes, and continue his teaching. Having confided them all to the Lord's protection, they resumed their journey back through, back through Syrian Antioch. On their arrival, they gathered the church together and told the faithful of all that God had brought about through their, through their mediation and how he had opened the, to the pagans the door of the faith. It was then that some brethren from Judea claimed that it was necessary for the pagan converts to be circumcised. A lively discussion followed, and Paul and Barnabas were sent to the apostles in Jerusalem to put an end to the strife. There they reported all that God had done among the pagans, and after having decreed that the useless burden of the law should not be imposed upon the Gentiles, the pillars, Peter, James, and John, extended the hand of brotherhood to Paul and Barnabas as a sign of communion 
entrusting to them the evangelization of the pagans, while they reserved to themselves those who were circumcised. On his return to Antioch, Paul proclaimed the good news for some time. It was then that he, it was there, it was then that he censured Peter, who from fear of the Jewish converts had stopped associating with the faithful among the Gentiles. We just heard that story. Some time later, Paul decided to undertake a second great missionary journey. A second one. The first one, we heard all the details, right? This is, this is St. Paul's second one. To visit and encourage the brethren in the towns that he had earlier evangelized. Having quarreled with Barnabas over Mark, who had left them in Pamphylia, they separated. Barnabas and Mark left for Cyprus, while Paul, taking Silas with him, left on foot going north. They went through Syria and Cilicia, where they strengthened the disciples, and then visited Derbe, Lystra, or Lystra, and Iconium. At Lystra, they joined Timothy. Then their mission, having encountered obstacles in Asia and Bithynia, they went to Troas, where Paul had a vision, calling him to take the gospel to Macedonia. Now he's in Greece, okay? Arriving in Philippi through Samothrace and Neapolis, the apostles spoke on the Sabbath day to the women who had gathered outside the town to pray. The Lord opened the heart of Lydia, who was baptized with all her household and offered hospitality to the apostles. But when Paul had driven a demon out of a slave who gave oracles, his masters, seeing their hope of gaining disappear, turned Paul and Silas over to the magistrate, accusing them of making trouble in the town. They were beaten mercilessly and thrown into a deep cell, their feet clamped in irons, Around midnight, while the two apostles were singing God's praises, a violent earthquake shook the prison. The prisoner's chains fell off and the doors opened. Before this marvel, their jailer asked to receive baptism at once with his whole house. In the morning, the lectors who went to release them were terrified to learn that they were Roman citizens and made them a public apology. On their arrival in Thessalonica, again, this is Greece now, Paul is over in, in Greece, Paul went to the synagogue, as was his custom, to preach Christ risen from the dead, firstly to the Jews. Some among them let themselves be convinced, and also a large number of pagans and well-born ladies. The Jews, however, continued stirring up trouble and contracted the authorities, accusing the apostle of acting against the emperor's edicts in proclaiming another king, Jesus. Leaving the town at night in secret, Paul and Silas went to Berea, where the Jews received their teaching with great eagerness and many conversions followed. But troublemakers having arrived in Thessalonica, Paul had to depart for Athens, leaving Silas and Timothy behind to confirm the work that had been accomplished. Arriving in the capital of Hellenism, Athens, Paul was overwhelmed to see the city full of idols. He talked with the Jews in their synagogue and was every day in the Agora where the pastor, with the passers-by the philosophers of those avid for the latest news. Speaking one day, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, the apostle said to them that passing through the city, he had found an altar carrying the inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. That's Acts 17, 23. He said loudly and continued while what he was saying about God, the creator of heaven and earth, making skillful use of the best of the philosopher's intimations concerning the divine vocation of man. But when he began to speak of a man risen from the dead, his hearers mocked him, except only for Dionysius, the Areopagite, whose feast day is October 3rd, by the way, a woman called Damaris, October 2nd, and several others who embraced the faith. Leaving Athens then, Paul went to Corinth, where he stayed in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. Feast day, February 13th, by the way, and that's Great Maggie's patron, Priscilla, who practiced, as he did, the craft of tent making. During the week, he earned his bread by the sweat of his brow without making use of his, of his right to live by the preaching of the gospel in order not to be a charge on anyone or give his opponents any pretext for accusing him. On the Sabbath, he would speak in the synagogue. Confronted once more by the Jews' opposition, he turned to the Gentiles, and many Corinthians were baptized. Apart from rare exceptions, Paul himself did not baptize, for his work was to lay the foundations by the preaching of the good news and to leave it to his disciples to build the temple of God in the hearts of the faithful and organize the ecclesiastical community. 
He later wrote to the Christians of Corinth, the two epistles that have come down to us, and possibly others, to reprimand them for the rivalries that were dividing them, blaming practices that departed from evangelical behavior, and teaching them to do everything decently and in order, seeking spiritual gifts of which the crown is charity for their common edification in one single body. Encouraged to, to persevere in his preaching, Paul stayed a year and a half in, in that town, and it was there that he wrote his first epistle to the Christians of Thessalonica, who were worried about what happened to the dead at the glorious coming of Christ. The Jews, insatiable in their plotting, managed to denounce him before Galleon, the proconsul of Achaia, but Galleon refused to be party to a controversy concerning the law and dismissed him. Taking eventual leave of the brethren in Corinth, Paul set sail for Antioch. Stopping in Ephesus, he preached briefly in the synagogue and then left the town, promising those who had listened to him with interest that he would return again very soon. In fact, after having spent some time in Antioch, he left on a third great journey. Having passed through Galatia and Phrygia, confirming the faith of the disciples, he returned to Ephesus to continue the work he had undertaken. He found there a dozen Christians converted by Apollos, but who had only received the baptism of John. As soon as they were baptized and Paul had laid hands on them, they began to prophesy, filled with the Holy Spirit. During these three years in Ephesus, Paul spoke of the kingdom of heaven, and when he came up against the opposition of the Jews, took the disciples aside and completed their instruction in a hired hall. It was thus that the good news was able to be spread throughout the province of Asia. Furthermore, the apostle, through his letters, supported the Christians of Corinth and Galatia. God worked many miracles by his hands so that it was enough to lay handkerchiefs or towels that had touched his body on the sick for them to be healed. Such success worried the goldsmiths who made their living from the cult of Artemis. They rose up, causing great confusion in the town, and the crowd dragged Paul's companions to the, to the amphitheater, which, by the way, is still there in Ephesus. When the tumult had died down from fear of the Roman authorities, Paul decided to leave for Macedonia, and exhorting the faithful while moving from one place to another, he returned to Corinth, where he spent the winter. This was in the years 57 and 58. He, he there set right the deviations which he had condemned in his letter, and it was there that he wrote his great epistle to the Romans that definitively set out the doctrine of salvation as a free gift accorded by the grace of God with the condition of faith in Christ. Forgive me, I know this is long. Y'all are being really good here, though, in, in staying with me here, so God bless you, thank you. We're almost done here. Well, almost, yeah. Having been entrusted with the proceeds of the collection made for the brethren in Jerusalem, he resolved to go and give it to them himself on the day of Pentecost. The Jews, having yet again stirred up a plot against him, he meant to set sail for Syria, but the Spirit told him to return to Macedonia. At Troas, while he was teaching the brethren throughout the night after the celebration of the Eucharist, a young man called Eutychus, overcome by sleep, fell from the third floor. They took him up dead, but Paul raised him. He then continued on foot to Assos and Myra. Myra is the town that St. Nicholas was the bishop in, Myra in Lycia. Then set, uh, set sail for Miletus, where the elders of the community of Ephesus went to see him. He told them that the Spirit had warned him that chains and tribulations awaited him in Jerusalem. But he added, and this is Acts 20, I count not my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Then reminding them of the labors that he had undertaken for the founding of their church, he exhorted them to sacrifice themselves for the edification of the faithful, and have, after having knelt in prayer, they all threw themselves in tears on Paul's neck to say a last goodbye to him. Passing through Kos, Rhodes, and Patras, the apostle stopped in Tyre to teach the faithful there, then left for, for Ptolemy and continued on foot to Palestinian Caesarea, where he was received into the house of Philip the deacon. In spite of warnings by the prophet Agabus, he willingly continued his way to Jerusalem, saying to his companions that he was ready not only to be arrested, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. 
He was welcomed with joy by the brethren of the holy city. And the elders, having gathered at James's house, Paul told them in detail about his missions to the Gentiles and gave them the money sent by the young communities to help the poor of Jerusalem. Warned by the apostles that the Jews would not fail to accuse him of having abandoned the practices of the law, he then joined a group of men who, under a vow, were going to offer sacrifice in the temple. When the seven days of this vow were almost ended, some Jews from Asia, having seen Paul in the temple, stirred up the crowd and laid hands on him, accusing him of preaching everywhere against the temple and the prescriptions of Judaism. They dragged him out of the temple, seeking to have him killed, but the soldiers intervened to make them let him go and carried him to the steps, to the steps up to the Ant Antonia fortress. Paul, speaking to the people in Aramaic, succeeded in gaining silence and gave them an account of his conversion. But as soon as he mentioned his mission to the Gentiles, the crowd yelled, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. The tribune ordered that he be put to torture, but Paul, having revealed that he was a Roman citizen, he was spared. The next day he appeared before the Sanhedrin and declared that he was imprisoned for his hope in the resurrection. These words provoked a quarrel between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Remember that whole argument that the Sadducees and Pharisees had in the Gospels about the resurrection. Paul masterfully did this. He did this on purpose, by the way. Who were deeply divided on this question, and he was taken back to the fortress. The Lord appeared to him in the following night and said to him, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you will now bear witness also at Rome. The tribune, learning that the Jews had, hot, had hatched a plot to kill him, had Paul transferred under strong escort to Caesarea, where the procurator Felix lived. The high priest and several of the elders went to give their deposition against him, but Paul demonstrated that there was nothing in his conduct worthy of condemnation with regard to either Roman or Jewish law. Felix deferred the matter unto the return of Lysias, the tribune, and in the meantime went with his wife to hear the prisoner speak of the Lord Jesus. But as soon as Paul spoke of continence and the judgment to come, Felix, in alarm, sent him away. The apostle remained a prisoner in Caesarea for two years until Porcius Festus, having succeeded Felix in the year 60, wanted him to, to be taken to Jerusalem for judgment. But Paul, as a Roman citizen, appealed to the emperor. He appeared before King Agrippa, who had come to Caesarea to greet Festus, and the latter, after having heard his apologia, de declared that he could have been released, that he not that had he had not appealed to Caesar. This particular Caesarea is, is on the coast there. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, uh, the ruins of, of a fortress that King Herod Agrippa had built. And that's another place that we go to uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in our trip to Israel, God willing. Embarking with his escort of soldiers and a few disciples, they arrived at Myra in Lycia, where they found a ship leaving for Italy. It was with great difficulty that they reached the south of Crete, and not wanting to spend the winter there, they continued the voyage in spite of Paul's warnings. Shortly afterwards, the ship was seized by a violent storm. When they had lost all hope of being saved, Paul informed them that an angel had appeared to him and told him that his life would be saved, together with all on board, because it was necessary that he reach Rome. After a fortnight, two weeks, the ship ran aground at Malta, where the survivors were able to spend the winter. They took to the, winter, they took to the water again three months later, and stopping at Syracuse and Regium, landed at the port of Puteoli, and went on to Rome on foot along the Appian Way. Some of the brethren, informed that he was coming, came out to meet the illustrious prisoner, and once he had arrived in the capital, Paul was able to enjoy a favored regime, living in an apartment where he could freely receive visitors. It was during this two-year house arrest, 61 to 63, that he wrote his epistles to the churches of Colossae, Philippi, and Ephesus, in which he evokes all the depth of the mystery of Christ, hidden in God in the beginning and revealed in the fullness of time, when in him in, in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in the flesh, all beings, both on, heaven, on earth and in heaven, are reconciled by the cross. And men become adopted sons of God through the grace of the Holy Spirit. 
untiringly prescribing to the churches that they do all things in order and in charity, the apostle exhorted his disciples to put on the new man so that growing in charity and the truth of the gospel toward him who is the head, they will come to the fullness of the body of Christ. The trial before the emperor's tribunal ended in a withdrawal of the accusation. Paul was freed, and from Rome he may have gone to Spain, as had long been his desire. Romans 15. It may be that he made a further journey to the east, passing through Crete, Asia Minor, Troas, and Macedonia, as witnessed by his epistles to Timothy and Titus. Arrested again in 67, in circumstances that remain obscure, he was taken to Rome with Luke alone, and subjected to a regime that was much harsher than that during his first imprisonment. From the depths of his stinking, cold, dark, and damp cell, the apostle wrote, this is in 2 Timothy 4, The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. After having been submitted to judgment as a Roman citizen, he was beheaded on the Ostian Road, some distance from the city. It is said that the apostle's head bounced three times on the ground and three springs gushed forth there. A little footnote here. The heads of the holy apostles Peter and Paul are preserved in the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome. Part of St. Paul's body is under the altar of the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls and the other with the body of St. Peter under the altar of St. Peter's in the Vatican. This feast was instituted in the 4th century to commemorate the translation of the bodies of these leaders to the catacomb of St. Sebastian on the Appian Way to escape profanation during Valerian's persecution. When peace was regained, Pope Sylvester returned them to their original burial places. O oh, glorious and all audible Apostle Paul, Please pray for us. Again, forgive me for the length of this, but now you know these apostles a little better than you did before, right? Now you know what great lengths, beloved, they went to to proclaim the faith, to preserve the faith so that it might be handed down to you and I, so that we might embrace the Lord Jesus in the fullness of his kingdom through their labors. That's why this feast is so beautiful and it's so important for us, especially in the Patriarchate of Antioch. So, I thank you all for coming. So let's pray together. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's probably burned out by now. We're going to do tone four, okay. The, uh, the refrain, uh, take a look at your, at your papers there. The refrain uh, that is at the end of all of the, uh, the Kuntaki and the, Kuntaki and the Ikoi, Rejoice Peter and Paul with all the holy apostles. Uh, we'll be singing that together in tone four. Rejoice Peter and Paul with all the holy apostles. Okay, you'll get it as we sing it. I think we're, I think we don't have any more. I think we're out of them. Sorry. I, I should have anticipated a greater crowd tonight. Forgive me. Thank you. Okay. Blessed is our God always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O our God, glory to thee, heavenly King and Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who is everywhere present and fills all things. Treasury of good gifts, giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. All Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. 
Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, 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 Lord have mercy. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. O come, let us worship and fall down before God our King. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ our King and our God. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ himself, our King and our God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy and according to the multitude of thy compassions. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know mine iniquity, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil before thee, that thou might be justified in thy words and prevail when thou art judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother bear me. For behold, thou hast loved truth, the hidden and secret things of thy wisdom hast thou made manifest unto me. Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be made clean. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. Thou shalt make me to hear joy and gladness. The bones that be humbled, they shall rejoice. Turn thy face away from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Pray to me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and with a governing spirit establish me. I shall teach transgressors thy ways, and the ungodly shall turn back unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. My tongue shall rejoice in thy righteousness. O Lord, thou shalt open my lips, and my mouth shall declare thy praise. For if thou hast desired sacrifice, I had given it. Hoburnt offerings, thou shalt not be pleased. The sacrifice unto God is a broken spirit. A heart that is broken and humbled, God will not despise. Do good, O Lord, in thy good pleasure unto Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be builded. Then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with oblation and hoburnt offerings. Then shall they offer bollocks upon thine altar. I believe in one God, the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. He shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <laughs> the Lord who said of himself, I am the good shepherd, said unto thee, O first enthroned Peter, If thou lovest me, feed my sheep. And he who said, I am Jesus, said to thee, O preeminent apostle Paul, He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. And likewise to all your colleagues, his apostles, he said, As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Go ye and teach all nations. And ye receiving such grace from your good chief shepherd, as the foremost shepherds and teachers of all the world. From all misfortunes preserve ye us on the pasture of salvation, that we may cry unto thee, Rejoice, O Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, O Peter and Paul, 
with all the holy apostles. Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas, said Christ, the Son of the living God, unto thee, O glory, right glorious apostle Peter. How then can we worthily call thee blessed, who has been called blessed by God himself? Yet drawn faithfully by a debt of love alone, we cry out to thee thus. Rejoice first among the apostles, the foundation and of the holy church. Rejoice, mighty pillar and ground of the orthodox faith. Rejoice, ardent lover of the teaching of Christ. Rejoice, first seated among the council of the apostles. Rejoice, good gatekeeper of the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice, renowned physician for those who repent of their sins. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, beholders of God, for ye are the light of all the world. Rejoice, for through you hath the faith which saveth us shown forth Christ from Christ in every place. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. O teacher of the Gentiles, who received thy title wondrously from on high, thou dost believe when Jesus said unto thee, Saul, why persecutest thou me, who cannot be touched by unbelief? Yet believe thou henceforth, for lo, contrary audacity darkeneth thee. But I have chosen thee to be a witness to my judgments before the rulers, the nations, and the children of Israel. And thou, O apostle, called such things by God, it's cry out, Alleluia. Alleluia. Hearing a voice from heaven, O Saul, thou wast thereafter unable to see, for thou hast adversely persecuted the inaccessible one, and didst receive blindness of thine eyes in return for thy zeal for the law. But guided to the front, to the font, thou didst attain unto divine baptism, where, having been immersed with faith, the sight of thy bodily and spiritual eyes was restored. Wherefore, mindful of thy miraculous calling, we cry out to thee. Rejoice, O apostle, called by God, sent forth to preach to the nations. Rejoice, chosen vessel, which pourest forth the sweetness of the faith of Christ upon all men. Rejoice, beholder of the divine light, which illumineth from on high. Rejoice thou who more than others wast enlightened by grace after the shadow of the old covenant. Rejoice thou who on, on earth didst converse with the Lord Jesus who appeared to thee. Rejoice thou who following Christ didst labor more than others for the salvation of man. Rejoice all ye holy apostles, for ye are like the heavens which proclaim the glory of God. Rejoice for ye are the stars which crown the church the bride of Christ. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Chosen from fisher nets for the preaching of the gospel, and from catching fish to catching men into the light of the true knowledge of God, O great apostle John, disciple, friend, and devoted companion of Christ, Thou didst love the one true lover of mankind with thy whole heart, soul, and mind, ever crying unto him, Alleluia. Alleluia. When the sovereign creator of the angelic host and of the whole universe took our flesh and appeared upon earth for our salvation, on seeing thee, O blessed John, as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he called thee with thy brother to apostolic labor, and thou didst leave thy fisher's nets and thy father in the boat. And from then on thou didst follow unswervingly in the Savior's footsteps. Therefore we cry unto thee, Rejoice thou who for the love of Christ did leave thine earthly father. Rejoice thou who found in Christ the heavenly father. Rejoice thou who didst despise the world, the, despise the world and its delusive pleasures. Rejoice, thou who didst receive and exchange heavenly blessings. Rejoice, thou who didst completely subdue thy flesh to thy spirit. Rejoice, thou who didst subject thy spirit to thy sweetest Lord Jesus. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, for you are as a guard upon the walls of Jerusalem. Rejoice, O our instructors who keep watch over the souls of Christians. 
Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. As a disciple of the Baptist and forerunner John, O first called Andrew, thou dost hearken unto his prophetic words, Behold the Lamb of God, and leaving thy first teacher, thou wast the first to follow Christ, asking, Master, where dwellest thou? Hearing his call, come and see, thou didst leave all to abide with him, learning how to sing Alleluia. Alleluia. Seeing the God thou didst love walking in the flesh on earth, O first call of his eyewitnesses, thou didst cry out to thy brother full of joy. Simon, we have found the Messiah, the one whom the prophets announced in the Spirit, Wherefore we honor thee as the first called of the disciples, the brother of Peter, crying out to thee with these words, Rejoice, first called of Christ's disciples. Rejoice, thou who didst first call others to follow him. Rejoice, thou who wast instructed by the forerunner. Rejoice, thou who didst heed his call to follow Christ. Rejoice, thou who didst take up thy cross and deny thyself daily. Rejoice, who through the cross was joined completely to Christ. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, who are whole as doves and through hope have been furnished with wings like unto eagles. Rejoice, for where Christ was in the body, there were ye gathered together. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Elder brother of John the theologian, O Apostle James, thou wast called to follow after Christ, and leaving thy father and thy nets, thou didst join thyself completely unto him, ever crying, Alleluia. Alleluia. As one of the three apostles chosen by Christ to be the recipient of the greatest revelations, Thou didst see him in glory on the holy mountain and in agony of spirit in the garden of Gethsemane. Thou also wast granted the great privilege of being the first apostle to suffer for thy master. Wherefore, O proto-martyr among the apostles, we faithful cry unto thee thus, Rejoice thou who didst leave all to follow Christ. Rejoice thou who wast granted by him the knowledge of heavenly mysteries. Rejoice, thou who spurned the vanity of the world and loved the spiritual life. Rejoice, thou who didst forsake corruptible nets and didst fish the whole world with incorruptible ones. Rejoice, quickly interceding comforter of the sorrowful. Rejoice, healer who accepts no recompense for curing ailments of body and soul. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, for ye are branches of Christ, the true vine. Rejoice for your husbandmen, of the vineyard of Christ. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, uh, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Instructed in the holy scriptures from thy youth, O holy apostle Philip, thou dost immediately respond to the call of Christ and follow him. Finding Nathanael, thou dost proclaim to him we have found him of whom Moses spoke in the law and the prophets did write, even Jesus of Nazareth, to whom we must ever sing Alleluia. Alleluia. Illumined by the radiance of the great light, O Philip, thou didst shine as a lamp for the whole world. Preaching the gospel with great zeal, thou didst enlighten the nations which lay in darkness in the shadow of death. Together with thy sister and fellow apostle Nathaniel, thou wast counted worthy to suffer for his sake, crucified upside down on a tree, mindful of thy great love for Christ and thy great boldness. Now before him we ever cry out unto thee. Rejoice, O holy apostle, who found in Christ the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets. Rejoice, thou who didst proclaim him to be the coming Messiah. Rejoice, thou who didst bear witness of him, come and see. Rejoice, thou who wast counted worthy to die for his sake. Rejoice, thou who betrothest the souls of the faithful to Christ and summonest them to the heavenly bridal chamber. 
Rejoice, thou who didst endure many tribulations, and hast made others also steadfast to endure them. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, for like flowers do ye impart fragrance to all the world. Rejoice, ye who through your fragrance dispel the stench of iniquity. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Sitting under a fig tree, O Apostle Nathaniel, thou wast seen of Christ before Philip called thee, and coming unto him thou didst receive from him the word, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, thus amazed at his omniscience, Thou didst cry unto him as to the incarnate Son of God. Alleluia. Alleluia. O Apostle Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew, thou didst preach the gospel to those in foreign lands, performing miracles. Through them thou didst call the, the heathen to abandon their idols and follow after Christ. Wherefore, as to a faithful teacher and wondrous healer, we the faithful cry unto thee. Rejoice, thou who didst inquire, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Rejoice, thou who didst find in Christ the answer to thy question. Rejoice, thou who wast amazed by Christ, omniscience. Rejoice, thou who didst receive from him the promise to behold greater things than these. Rejoice, greatly fruitful branch which buds forth from paradise full of spiritual food. Rejoice, thou who by thy teaching hast illumined all the earth as with an unwaning light. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, as tender olive shoots. Rejoice, for because of you is all like a fruitful olive tree in the house of God. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. As a servant of the word in his divine incarnation, O Apostle Thomas, thou didst deeply drink from the sea of wisdom. A fisher of men, thou didst pull them from the depths of error by the rod of the cross. Through the net of thy teachings, thou hast enlightened the whole world, teaching all to sing Alleluia. Alleluia. Not present with the other apostles on the eve of the day of Christ's resurrection, Thou didst proclaim, except I see in his hands the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Through this lack of faith, thou hast strengthened the faith of believers for putting thy hand into his side. Thou didst proclaim, my Lord and my God. Wherefore, as to one initiated by the two natures of Christ into his two energies, we the faithful cry unto thee. Rejoice thou who with faithless voice didst proclaim thine unbelief. Rejoice thou who with boldness didst proclaim the Lord's resurrection. Rejoice thou who didst thrust thy hand into his side. Rejoice thou who thereby wast initiated into the divine mysteries. Rejoice thou who wast brought on a cloud to Jerusalem for the repose of the Theotokos. Rejoice thou who wast granted the knowledge of her bodily assumption. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, who are like noetic palm trees and cedars. Rejoice, ye who have been transplanted to heaven as the garden of the heavenly Father. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Called from the ranks of tax collectors and sinners to be his disciple, O Apostle Matthew, thou didst leave all things, renouncing trouble and confusion, and did follow Christ, cleaving unto him with thy whole heart. Thou didst cry to him as one delivered from iniquity. Alleluia. Alleluia. Putting the wisdom of the wise to shame, O initiate of heavenly mysteries, Apostle Matthew, Thou wast made of Christ a lamp to enlighten the ends of the earth, and at his command thou didst shine forth heavenly knowledge. Thus thou wast counted worthy to write his divine gospel, recording for us the words and deeds of Christ and the mystery of his divine passion. Wherefore, as to a faithful evangelist and beloved apostle, 
we faithfully cry unto thee. Rejoice, thou who didst leave thy tax collector's booth to follow Christ. Rejoice, thou who didst hear the words, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Rejoice, I witness to the passion of Christ. Rejoice, thou who didst record faithfully for us his holy resurrection. Rejoice, container of mysteries, uncontainable for the human mind. Rejoice, thou who revealest them to the faithful. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, who perfectly kept all the commandments of the Lord. Rejoice, ye who left all and followed after Christ and found all in him. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Submitting thyself, O holy apostle James, the son of Alphaeus, to the orders of the Master, thy soul was enlightened in abundance, O blessed one. He called thee to be his apostle, and did send thee into all the world to make disciples of the nations, teaching them how to sing Alleluia. Alleluia. The radiance of the Spirit descended upon thee in the form of a tongue of fire, and the power of the Most High didst overshadow thee, and thou didst become a holy witness to Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. With great power, both in word and in deed, thou didst spread abroad the saving news of the incarnate word of God, rooting out idol worship, driving demons out of men, and healing all manner of sickness and disease in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wherefore, as to the faithful disciple of Christ and worthy apostle, we cry out unto thee, Rejoice, thou who didst proclaim Christ to be the one foundation of the faithful, Rejoice, thou who hast made all the pious steadfast in that confession. Rejoice, mystagog of great understanding of the revelation of the Lord. Rejoice, confessor of the one God in three persons. Rejoice, fervent uprooter of idols. Rejoice, compassionate healer of the passions. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles who have suffered cruelly as valiant warriors of Christ. Rejoice, ye who have vanquished the kingdoms of the earth by faith and have received heavenly things. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Son of Joseph the betrothed and of thy mother Salome, O Apostle Jude, Thou didst not believe in Christ in thy youth, jealously refusing to grant unto him an equal portion of thy father's estate. But coming to faith, thou didst repent of thy former delusion, crying aloud unto him, Alleluia. Alleluia. We the faithful praise thee, O Apostle Jude, as the brother of the word who shone forth from the Father before all ages, and who took flesh from the virgin in a wondrous manner in these latter days. Thou wast his relative and his true disciple. Thus venerating thee, we celebrate thy memory, O herald of God, and we sing to thee with faith. Rejoice, mountain flowing with the sweetness of God. Rejoice, peaceful river refreshing the hearts of believers. Rejoice, stern rebuke of those who would turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. Rejoice, firm opposition of those who would deny the Lord Jesus. Rejoice, proclaimer of the faith, once delivered to the saints. Rejoice, thou who didst commend thy brethren to him who is able to keep thee from falling. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles like the mountains of Zion. Rejoice, ye who let the sweetness of salvation fall upon us. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, uh, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Having beheld the miracles of Christ, O most glorious Simon, thou didst faithfully follow God revealed in the flesh, of whom thou wast beloved, and thou wast joined to the company of his twelve chosen apostles, and didst receive the name Zealot, for thou wast zealous for his glory, continuously singing to him, Alleluia. Alleluia. At 
thy holy wedding, O Apostle Simon. Christ did reveal the power of his divinity by changing the water into wine, also revealing to us the power of the prayers of his holy mother. Wherefore, to thee, as to an eyewitness of his miracles and his great love for the Theotokos, we the faithful cry out in great joy to thee. Rejoice, bridegroom most fair, wondrously called forth from an earthly wedding feast, to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Rejoice, thou who didst leave an earthly bride and didst follow in his footsteps. Rejoice, thou who wast glorified in heaven and on earth. Rejoice, thou who didst faithfully serve God, the Word incarnate. Rejoice, thou who didst show great zeal in preaching the gospel of righteousness. Rejoice, thou who didst love Jesus, the sweetest Lord, with all thy heart. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, like torrents of rivers which gladden the city of the church of God. Rejoice, for ye are like the streams of sweetness, which give all the faithful to drink from the cup of salvation. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. O most glorious and laudable disciples of Christ, Peter and Paul, first enthroned and equally enthroned, together with all the holy apostles who have enlightened all the universe with the holy faith and will come with Christ to judge the whole world. Your proper dignity is not on earth, but is the glory and praise rendered in heaven. Accepting now our unworthy entreaty, by your worthy supplications preserve us from all misfortunes, and beseech Christ, the just judge, to be merciful to us at the last judgment, that, saved by your mediation, we may chant unto God our Savior, Alleluia. Alleluia. <laughs> Most glorious and laudable disciples of Christ, Peter and Paul, first enthroned and equally enthroned, <clears throat> together with all the holy apostles, who have enlightened all the universe with the holy faith, and will come with Christ to judge the whole world. Your proper dignity is not on earth, but is the glory and praise rendered in heaven. Accepting now our unworthy entreaty, by your worthy supplications preserve us from all misfortunes, and beseech Christ the just judge to be merciful to us at the last judgment, that saved by your mediation, we may chant unto God our Savior, Alleluia. Alleluia. O most glorious and laudable disciples of Christ, Peter and Paul, first enthroned, then equally enthroned, together with all the holy apostles who have enlightened all the universe with the holy faith and will come again with Christ to judge the whole world. Your proper dignity is not on earth, but is the glory and praise rendered in heaven, accepting now our unworthy entreaty. By your worthy supplications, preserve us from all misfortunes, and beseech Christ, the just judge, to be merciful unto us at the last judgment, that, saved by your mediation, we may chant unto God our Savior, Alleluia. Alleluia. Turn, turn back to the beginning to Ecos 1. Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas, said Christ, the son of the living God. Unto thee, O right glorious apostle Peter, how then call, can we worthily call thee blessed who has been called blessed by God himself, yet drawn faithfully by a debt of a love alone? We cry out, <coughs> out to thee thus, Rejoice first among the apostles, foundation of the Holy Church. Rejoice, mighty pillar and ground of the Orthodox faith. Rejoice, ardent lover of the teaching of Christ. Rejoice, first seated among the council of the apostles. Rejoice, good gatekeeper of the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice, renowned physician for those who repent of their sins. Rejoice, all ye holy apostles, beholders of God, for ye are the light of all the world. Rejoice, for through you hath the faith which saveth us shone forth from Christ in every place. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, 
with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Kentucky and one. Kentucky and one, yeah. The Lord, who has said of himself, I am the good shepherd, said unto thee, O first enthroned Peter, if thou lovest me, feed my sheep. And he who said, I am Jesus, said of thee, O preeminent apostle Paul, he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. And likewise to all your colleagues, his apostle, he said, As my Father has sent me, even so I send, so send I you. Go ye and teach all nations, and ye receiving such grace from your good chief shepherd, as the foremost shepherds and teachers of all the world, from all misfortunes, Preserve ye us on the pasture of salvation, that we may cry out to you. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Rejoice, Peter and Paul, with all the holy apostles. Really right to bless the Otheotokos, the blessed and most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, you gave birth to God the Word. To Theotokos, we magnify thee. Let us kneel, beloved, as we say the prayer at the back. O most glorious apostles who laid down your lives for Christ and beautified his pasture with your blood, hearken unto the prayers and sighs of your children which are now offered up with contrite hearts. For lo, we have darkened ourselves with iniquities, and for this cause we have we been covered with misfortunes and as with showers, and we have become exceedingly poor in the oil of a good life. And we cannot fend off the ravening wolves which boldly strive to lay hands on the inheritance of God. O ye mighty ones, bear ye our infirmities, and separate yourselves not from us in spirit, that we not depart utterly from the love of God, but with your mighty assistance defend us, that the Lord have mercy on us all for the sake of your prayers, that he rend asunder the handwriting of our countless sins, and that he vouchsafe us with all the saints the blessed kingdom and wedding feast of his Lamb. To whom be honor and glory, thanksgiving and worship unto the ages of ages. Amen. Holy God. Holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. All Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. You have the apology. O first enthroned of the apostles and teachers of the world, entreat the Master of Christ, a Master our Christ God, that he grant peace unto the world and great mercy to our souls. Glory to thee, O Christ our God, and our whole glory to thee. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Father, bless.
Christ our true God, through the intercessions of His all immaculate and all blameless Holy Mother, of the holy, glorious, and all laudable apostles Peter and Paul, whose feast day we celebrate this day, and of all the saints, have mercy upon us and save us, for as much as He is good and loveth mankind. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. God bless you. Now that we know the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul better than we did before, so let us continue to develop and deepen our relationship with them so that on that great day, but by the grace of God, we'll all stand before him and inherit the kingdom of heaven. We will recognize them and they'll recognize us as well because of their prayers for us. May God bring all of that to bear in all of our lives for the glory of his holy name. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. First in front of the apostles and teachers of the world, entreat the master of all that he grant peace unto the world and great mercy to our souls. O first in front of the apostles and teachers of the world, entreat the master of all that he grant peace to the world and great mercy to our souls. O first in front of the 